uh, Tosif Khan from Canada. Um, so my question is to Fred. Uh, very nice presentation on fruit juice. Uh, my question is, uh, so, so fruits have consistently shown to have a protective effect, but fruit juice are not, have not. And you, uh, in a sense, you indicate that they're not different. Uh, some people say that because of intact cell wall, the, 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 the fruits are different from fruit juice even though if the sugar content is the same. Uh, and then uh, my uh, the just related question is, would uh, fruit, 100% fruit juice be different from smoothies, which in which you actually put in all the fiber and everything together and make a juice out of it? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, if you have the fruit and you squeeze out the juice, you have, you have the liquid and the, the cell components that, that, that are left out. You miss part of the fiber that is remaining. If you make a smoothie, you have everything in there, uh, including uh, intact cells and disrupted cells. So if, if, if uh, therefore my, my, my recommendation is whole fruits go above everything. If you want to make a liquid, go for a smoothie that's healthier than uh, in terms of overall components than just the juice. Of course, if you have the juice, you miss part of the fiber and the fiber-related uh, micronutrient complexes that, that are left out. I can tell you the most prominent effect you see in apple juice, if you take apple juice, which is uh, clear juice, it is very high, it's relatively high in fructose. There is a lot of uh, polyphenols in there. But, but most of the other bioactive components remain in the apple pomace that is separated. And, and, and these have profound health effects, and those have been studied also on, uh, on reduction of cancer risks in, 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 vivo, in vitro. Sorry, you see that clearly. So, so uh, a, a smoothie is, 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 in terms of overall content, better than, than the juice. I, I fully agree with that. Yeah? There's one drawback. Since whole fruits, some whole fruits are bitter, some smoothies are also bitter, and in food or beverage industry, we see a tendency that sugars are being added to smoothies. And then you get the same effect as juices with added sugars, which are negative. Jordan, please. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I have two questions, one for, uh, for David Jenkins. Uh, uh, another, another one for Angel. Uh, the first one is in relation to the prospective studies analyzing the association between pulses consumption and uh, outcomes. In most of these meta-analyses, they mix in some occasions because they talk about legumes. So, and in the term of legumes, you know that there are the pulses, but also soja, for example, and in some cases, also they include pine nut. Um, so, uh, I think it will be interesting to analyze separately the beneficial effects of soja and the beneficial effects of pulses, especially because, you know, uh, the com food composition of soja is there are some differences, important differences in relation to, to this. So uh, what do you think about this? And the, the second question is uh, to, to Angela uh, in relation to the last paper that you have presented in the, uh, this clinical trial. Uh, in most of the clinical trials that analyze metabolomics, they analyze the five signature after the two interventions or the three interventions. So, uh, but I think it's interesting to adjust for the baseline values of metabolites and also I think it's interesting to, un, uh, to adjust for differences in s several uh, um, factors that are different in the two groups uh, when you describe the population because some people are obese and others not. So if there are differences in body mass index or in the diabetes status or in the insulin resistance, this could influence the signature. So 
uh, I would like to know what do you have done in your study. Important point. Um, I think that the issue of the of the legume is an important one. <clears throat> I think that Jesus Sitter is. Um, view that it's the 7S globulin fraction that one finds in legumes and peanuts um, also uh, that um, may have some benefits in terms of cholesterol lowering through ApoB uh, <coughs> inhibition of synthesis. Um, and I think that that's, <coughs> sorry, I think that's an important point. And I think that you're right, the, the large number of studies um, would contain uh, soy studies. We've done a separate analysis on soy uh, just recently and come out with the same sort of effects. Again, uh, the same sort of small but nevertheless significant uh, reduction in LDL cholesterol, um, total cholesterol, LDL, no effect on HDL, no effect on triglyceride, etc. So I think that the, I, would, I would look at the legume story as, as a total legume story. The peas, beans, and lentils, I think, are another very interesting story. Probably we need more data um, in that area because for, for various reasons, soy, because it's, it's been such a useful protein source, has had more studies done in it. But my hope is that we'll get the same sort of results. Um, and uh, I think that will support a, a total overall vegetable protein legume approach. Okay, thank you for your question. The, um, the, 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 the values of the metabolites were adjusted for baseline values and also for multiple compari comparisons. Uh, for what concern uh, possible uh, differences uh, um, due to differences in insulin sensitivity, uh, males or, or females, uh, what uh, I can say is that uh, at least at the beginning, uh, the two groups were completely similar for what concern all these parameters. And the number of subjects does not allow to make different uh, um, analysis according to, different, uh, to these eventual differences. Uh, one question uh, your answer related to the metabolomics part of your presentation. Uh, what was the reason to choose these metabolites that you saw us? and not other metabolites that probably could be affected by the consumption of, of grains or involved in a pathway uh, leading, for example, to betaine from lysoposolopolids and TML. What was the reason, for example? Uh, I show uh, the, uh, the metabolites uh, significantly associated, but anyway, uh, with this analysis, uh, um, uh, also other metabolites were identified and then we, uh, the, all, the, the ones I show you are the ones uh, significantly associated with the uh, wool grain diet. Sorry? Or choline. Pauline, did you find any? Yes, uh, uh, um, there were um, many uh, uh, choline products uh, uh, associated with the... Uh, um, and TML, did you include? No, 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 there, no, there was no association. Okay, 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 thank you. Next. May I ask something <laughs> to the last presenter? Uh, have you any uh, data on metabolic outcome uh, in our study? And uh, have you done any relationship between uh, uh, metabolomics and uh, uh, clinical outcome? Yes, in, in fact, we perform co correlations, experiment correlations between the changes of metabolites and also changes in anthropometrical inflammation and, and HOMA insulin resistant um, parameter. And we found some, some interesting results. Yeah. We, we, we published these this results also. It's Vlad, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I'm looking for a little help from experts here. And, uh, uh, whether my contribution to save planet is uh, is good one, 
you know. So basically, Chris and David are talking about eating more pulses. And while I have no argument about eating pulses, good health, etc. But from my own experience, when you eat pulses, you pass a lot of gas. <laughs> so gas increases CO2 emission. <laughs> so then you have another scenario, who produces a lot of gas as well? A catalyst. So, uh, so what one can do to save the planet? So what I decided, <laughs> I become vegetarian, obviously eat whole grain and, and, and juices, you know, you know, to keep friendship here, at least if I lose other two. And, and so, so basically what I do, and I eat vegetarian diet, but cattle. Because I thought if I kill them, if they kill them for me, there will be no gas emission. So I'm saving the planet. So did I calculate something wrong? <laughs> um, Andreas is next. I just, I'm, I'm worrying, Vlad, you may starve. Because when you've killed the cattle, what else will you eat? Yeah, you've killed the cattle now, and you've got rid of the gas emission. What else are you going to eat once you've killed the cattle? I would suggest you go to, le to, to lentils, beans, and peas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question to uh, Christopher and also to David, and this is related to the pulses <coughs> and protein. So if you want to eat enough protein, 100 grams of cooked pulses has about 6 grams of protein, you, eat a, you need to eat real large amounts of pulses. Now, in, in that protein study where we compared plant and animal protein, Leguan, Legium, Anbau und Verwertung in German, this means uh, this was by eight people who grow pulses and who make them better, and we were the ones who did the human study. They made products for us, as you described, bread, noodles, and so. And the third product they made are what David showed me last time in Denmark, kind of like chicken made out of pulse protein. And what they do for that is they extrude it. So they put it through machines, which highly cross-links that protein. One of the concerns about protein is um, the proteostasis, so that aggregates end up in neurons, for instance, or other cells, and you don't get rid of them anymore, which is more or less what Alzheimer's disease for that plaque type protein does. Is anything known about those products, which are coming up now, I think, worldwide, pretty much, and quite interesting, certainly interesting for the planet and for gas production, and I think even Vladimir would profit from that, but uh, is anything known about consequences in metabolism of those things? I think this may raise a very important point, Andreas, and um, I, I think, unless, unless you know the answer, I'm not sure. I've tried to get money out of those who are making uh, these uh, impossible burgers and uh, beyond meat um, that are, are taking over part of a planetary niche. As you say, these are, these are extruded through a dye um, at, at high pressure and at various temperatures. And one can get cross-linking, just as you're saying. And that has always been a worry, whether, whether, whether one's actually, as one does this with, with very often protein um, isolates, so that you may actually have a, a, a very sort of unprotected form of protein. Um, we don't know. Um, I'm hoping that we don't have the same sort of problem that you get with, uh, with, with, with protein plaques that you lay down uh, in, in the brain at later, later stages. So I think, I think this is all a, a very important issue, and I think we've got to look at these new foods very carefully. I would say they're just returning. I mean, and the reason we use these foods, and I think Andrew's made a very important point, we use these particular foods because otherwise there's a lot of bulk in the foods when one combines uh, straight cereals and legumes to get the right protein amount. I would say, though, on behalf of the, the, the basic diet, that if you do take a large volume of cereals and legumes in, in a cooked form, in stews and these sort of things, you do get a large volume, and actually body weight maintenance is much easier under those circumstances, I think, because of sheer satiety and sheer fullness. So we are giving away, as we, as we look at more concentrated foods, we are giving away one of the possible advantages of the, the, the food in its native form. Fred, I'm going to defend the second report as usual. 
Um, the recommendation for the juice was actually around the acid content because it's very similar to that of sugar sweetened beverages and it was around tooth decay. Um, it actually had nothing whatsoever to do with um, diabetes. So you'll find it in appendix at the end. Um, they did a meta-analysis um, looking, or it was actually a correlation between acid content and tooth, tooth decay. And no matter what the age of the person, the higher acid um, drinks, whether they're sugar-sweetened beverages or fruit juice, they cause equal damage um, in combination with the sugar to teeth. But the other thing I would add to that is why children are at such high risk is because they're not that good at looking after their own teeth. So, um, and one food does not cause, if you, unless you're going to eat a lot of it, of course it won't cause tooth decay. So that was the reason, that was the actual reason for that sugar recommendation. Um, but the other thing, Chris, um, it's a question for you. Have you heard about agroforestry? where you're combining um, the growth, well, uh, the experiments I've seen in the UK, um, they're growing uh, trees along the edge of fields, they're quite narrow fields, they're not, you're not able to actually do the same vast agricultural systems that you can in other places. Um, looking at legumes and grains growing sequentially, and that actually increases yield with the um, trees as part of the um, system. So I don't know if you've heard of it or have seen much about it. I haven't, and that's probably a function of there being so much space in Canada <laughs> um, that it's not likely an, an application in Canada, so. Maybe, maybe one point related to the acid. Of course, you're completely right. Sugar-sweetened beverages have a quite low pH. Um, fruit juice is too. But in those terms, if you compare it, then we recommend to eat whole fruits. I have seen in the dentistry uh, uh, unit uh, pictures of people that eat one apple every day, and I've seen the effects on erosion. So if you have the fresh fruit and you bite in it with your teeth, it may be even more damaging than just uh, the, the juice that you have. The problem with very young children, that's why I mentioned below uh, four years, but there are parents that give children in the first year in zipping bottles and then you have continuous exposure to the acid which is very detrimental and parents should be educated about that, yeah. Okay, Jim please. I have a question for Angela and it really follows on from what I said this morning and more especially what, from what Andrew said in his talk later on. And that is, I wonder if you think that some of the discrepancies that you see in the clinical trials of whole grain uh, as compared with cohort studies, which are much more clear-cut in terms of benefit, could be due to the changing food supply of whole grains, because certainly in some countries you now have whole grain products that are highly refined uh, products, but they still qualify as whole grain because of the content, as compared with whole grain products which we had at the time that those prospective cohort studies made their measurements, when a whole grain was more of a whole grain than it is now. Yes, certainly. And for this reason, I presented uh, in my first slide uh, the um, definition of whole grain foods, which is not uh, um, uniform between the different agencies. This may explain uh, some differences. And uh, of course, also uh, the, the kind of processing of the wool grain may be important, uh, especially in uh, intervention studies. Joanne. Yeah, maybe to, to add something to that, the, on the processing, it, it is even much more complex than we think it is. If you go to breakfast here, you have these ready-to-eat cereals, and some of them are raw, just crushed whole grains. They are pretty high if it's whole wheat in MLA's trypsin inhibitors, and, and, and that is very, very active. So you have a significant amount of undigested starch that will, then will go to the colon and will reduce your glycemia. If you bake the food at a temperature of plus 200 grams or, or 200 degrees Celsius, or you, you cook uh, the material, then the protein is still there, but it is deactivated. 
so there are even more differences in whole grain, and, and the more we look into this, the more we feel that if we study whole grain or just grain, we should be much, much more specific in, in what we determine to be whole grain and how it has been processed in, uh, and described it in a meta section. Very much, Peter Jefferson, Denmark. Uh, it's a, a small comment to you, Fred, uh, about the Jews, uh, especially. And I was pleased about the concern about uh, the children, but I think it should also count for the adults in that regard. Uh, my question is this, uh, that even if you have a low glycemic index, it doesn't mean that it's a healthy food that you have. You can have chocolate also uh, with low glycemic index, and you don't eat like uh, all of you want of that. So uh, I think that that's a concern, and, and particularly in my concern is about the intake of, of the fructose, uh, also because the EU have liberated, you know, the use of high fructose corn syrup uh, in Europe, uh, which contain about 40% more uh, fructose than normal sucrose does. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, you know this is a deal they're making with 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 US before the Trump uh, came, uh, came to power, but uh, but that's my concern that we increase the amount of fructose intake. And we know that what you have shown uh, didn't show any data about how the lipids are reacting. And also, of course, if it's a moderate intake, it's, it's, it's may, it may be okay. But uh, we can see today that there is an increased intake of those uh, fruit uh, products, which. Uh, will uh, have effect especially on on the formation of, of fat and uh, and also both uh, lipid parameters increasing, but also fat liver and so on. And I think that's that's a concern that we should take uh, seriously in that concern, in that regards. I agree related to fructose and sugar sweetened beverages. I disagree related to the juices because what we see in the data and the clinical outcomes of juice drinkers, it all shows the opposite. There is no no increased liver fat content, there is no increased diabetes, no increased uh, uh, insulin resistance. So if you say fructose is a concern, I think yes, in high consumption it is. If you say isoglucose is a concern because it is liberated, it has 40% more fructose, that is not true. It does not have more fructose than, than the regular uh, isoglucose. Uh, if you look to the consumption of isoglucose in, in Europe over the years, it has gone down. And we recently had a discussion with the European commissioners in Brussels on that topic. And what the data show is, in fact, that the consumption of isoglucose is decreasing in Europe and the liberation will not lead to an increase. What it will do is it will lead to an increased production and an increased export to other parts of the world, as China, etc., where there is an increased need. So I'm, I'm not so much concerned about that. And even if you look to fructose, uh, the only relation that we see to fatty liver, etc., is related to overconsumption of energy by sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, that's what we clearly see, and, and that has been put very much into perspective by, uh, by, by uh, Tapi in, uh, in Lausanne, and also John Stephen looked into that. So I'm, I'm not so much concerned about that. I'm not totally agree about that about the high fructose corn syrup. It says itself high high fructose, and we make we have make uh, in fact uh, analysis of it and find out that it even contain up to 60% fructose, and and 40% uh, glucose. So there is a higher amount of fructose in in the in the in the substance, the sweetness substance from uh, from uh, corn. Well, yeah, that is in one variant of that. Yeah, but, yeah I know but, that variant. But, 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 but let's let's discuss that later yeah, on. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm not concerned about this. The, the the trends in in consumption throughout Europe show the opposite. There is a there is a decline. So. Uh, I but don't think that's a major It's concern. just liberated in November 2017, so I don't think we really know what's going to happen in the future about this. Okay, I think we will have to end the discussion there. Um, I'd like to thank all the presenters. For a Jeff, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to have okay, a... Okay, Jeff, a, a, a last, last word to Jeff. I don't have anything to say yet. Right, here I go. <laughs> Fructose versus glucose, um, there's a lot of concern about fructose, but the evidence shows that if you make a beverage high in fructose and another one high in glucose, liver fat deposition in humans, not diabetics, so I don't quite be sure what's happening there, uh, there's absolutely no difference at all. So it's all down to the energy content and not to the fructose it's itself or, or being glucose. I published a long while ago in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, the impact of fructose in diabetes and the dose response analysis the picture you that usually came out of that was that yes if you got over 100 grams of fructose per day you started to raise triglycerides but 
below that dose, there's a tendency for there to be lower triglycerides. So that's, you know, that's suggesting that we're not, we're not really in the true picture of fructose being quite so bad as we're all talking about it. Okay, on, on that note, no, I think we're going to have to end it. We can continue the discussion uh, out in the hallway or at the bar or somewhere else. But let us thank all the presenters, please.